Ladies and gentlemen, I would like, now like to invite the Honourable Professor Bob Carr to deliver his keynote speech. Professor Carr, please. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, citizens of Singapore, um, can I pay tribute to the President for his inspiring account of the new economy and the efforts of Seychelles to galvanize world support for the protection of the bulk of the world's surface, the majority of the world's surface. I think talking about geopolitics, uh, talking about economics, talking about trade agreements would all be undermined if the world was simply set on a path that saw this priceless stretch of nature degraded for all time. 2016 was the hottest year on record. We have no records of a year hotter than 2016. And Australia has lost a great part of the coral that comprises the Great Barrier Reef. Environmental protection is economic sustainability. The two go together. And the President is to be commended for reminding the world that a small island developing state has precious insights into our dependence on the health of the world's oceans. His many allies, the nations of the Caribbean, for example, or those countries close to Australia, uh, the uh, South Pacific, Fiji, represented here today, uh, one of those nations. Small island developing states, influential in the UN, influ influential in the Commonwealth of Nations, have precious insights and a lot of, a lot of debating power in focusing the world's attention on the health of the world's oceans. Uh, when, I, when I ceased to be Australian Foreign Minister in 2013, when the voters of Australia inconsiderately voted the government I was in, out of power, something that happens um, under our system, a lot of my friends and, and the media might have expected I'd indulge my long-term interest in American politics by taking up a position in an Australian university studying America. My view was that it was more interesting and challenging to gravitate to studying China. As Lee Kuan Yew has pointed out in his reflections on China, we don't know the character in international relations or in its domestic characteristics of China, 10, 20, 30 years off. But I thought in 2013, when I ceased to be Foreign Minister of Australia, that the US would offer no surprises. <laughs> now we contemplate a fissure, a rupture, with the things we assumed about the United States. And I want to talk about that today and to talk about Chinese diplomacy and to talk about the options it presents for a country like Australia, which is an ally of the United States to talk about the options for friends, partners and allies of the United States in the Trump presidency and given the challenge presented by a rising China. Donald Trump is different, although there are many efforts being made to normalize the choice that members of the US Electoral College will make when they come to implement the verdict state by state of the American people. He is a rupture, he is a change, this is not in the realm of the normal. For example, um, Trump has campaigned on the slogan, America First. This was the rallying cry of the isolationists in America in the late 30s, early 40s, a movement of which Charles A. Lindbergh was the symbol and the icon, America First. It was a slogan of isolationism. This is a break with American leadership since the time of Franklin Roosevelt and with a trend in American policy that goes back to Woodrow Wilson and America's commitment to spread democracy made as America entered World War I. America First is a slogan at odds 
for the tradition of American leadership, global strategic leadership, exercised since the victory of the Allies, made possible by American lives and arms and money in 1945. He's a protectionist. American leadership since 1945 has been about opening up world markets by reducing tariff protection. It was in America's interest to do that, but it was in the interest of raising world prosperity. It was fulfilled with the collapse of the Soviet bloc in 1989, which opened up more markets and generated a surge of prosperity, as did, of course, the great opening up of China. Now America is saying it wants to protect its markets, it will withdraw from initiatives to further open up to trade the economies of the world. America has said it will not commit to global leadership on the great thing that the President, President Michel has just addressed, and that is world environmental concerns. Up till now, American presidents have said the environmental challenge can only be addressed by multilateral action. These are problems, challenges, the quality of the oceans, bigger than any country, big, big, too big for any country on its own or even a coalition of countries. Global action is necessary to combat climate change. And we have a president who said he will withdraw from the Paris Agreement. This, like his position on trade, like his position on American, America's role in global strategic leadership is a break with the pattern of the past. Trump is the first populist to win the presidency since, well, I think we've got to say since Andrew Jackson won the presidency, breaking up the old party system in 1828, representing the, the, the claim on political power being made by laborers and tradespeople and small farmers in the American West. That was a rupture with the past. It introduced what we now see as a recognizable, as the recognizable American political party divide, or did until this election um, in, the, in November. Um, we now contemplate an America with the Democratic Party seems to be an alliance of people on welfare and the very rich and the highly educated, where the Republican Party is in fact what we might recognize as a Labour Party, a natural party of choice of the working class, or at least the white working class. This is a huge alignment because it brings with it the idea of trade protectionism into the Republican Party, which had been a great advocate of free trade, among other things. Forces of isolationism are now circulating in the Republican Party, the ruling party in the American Congress, in most of the states holding the White House. Whereas in the past, America's commitment to international engagement had been a cornerstone of Republican thinking. So these are different times, and they're forcing all America's friends and partners and allies to contemplate what will be the result in this region. Take a very practical and immediate manifestation. President Trump has confirmed that in his first day in office, he will use his executive power to kill the notion of a trans-Pacific partnership. Until only re recently, there was a hope that even in the lame duck period of this Congress, I think the hope was far too ambitious. This might have been ratified by the US Congress. It was a hope that sometime during the, the life of this presidency, the notion would be revived. Twelve nations in our region had committed to the TPP under American leadership. It was a commitment, as Washington saw it, to American leadership of the region. Indeed, to its rebalance to Asia. And now the White House says, being in no doubt, on the first day in office of the President on January the 20th next year, America's withdrawal from the TPP architecture is absolute and unarguable. 
And yet it had been presented to Australia and Singapore and other American friends, partners and allies as proof positive of America's strategic commitment to the region. Certainly there are other forces at work in the thinking of the Trump administration in an article in Foreign Policy by Alexander Gray and Peter Navarro, Navarro, Peter Navarro being a principal advisor to Trump on trade with China, there was a strong commitment to maintaining the rebalance to Asia and a criticism of the Obama administration for not being robust enough in giving effect to it. But carefully reading the article, I don't see a commitment by these Trump supporters, his advisors on foreign policy, his advisors on Asia and China in particular. I don't see the commitment to, for example, backing the Philippines in its maritime territorial disputes with China. The same, for example, that the United States will not allow under the threat of war will not allow any further Chinese dredging or military construction um, in disputed territories in the South China Sea. <laughs> Would a Trump-led America, with a commitment to defeating ISIS, to destroying its caliphate, to meeting the huge challenge of a missile-armed North Korea, something Barry Obama has discussed with the President-elect, which gives you some token of its significance, meeting other crises in the Middle East. Would a Trump-led America, with its huge domestic challenges, find the time and space for a stepped-up commitment in Asia? Will a Trump-led America be committed, it could well, to a more vigorous engagement over those DLP words, dominance, leadership, and primacy in Asia. The rise of China, America is the prevailing power, the challenge represented by China, but Trump let America be more robust in telling China it could not spread its power in the region. But Trump let America listen to nations like Singapore and Australia about the necessity to accommodate China's legitimate aspirations and not to seek to contain China. Above all, will the Trump administration listen to us when we say that a 45% tax on Chinese imports to America, Chinese exports to America, would be punishing to China, to the supply chain that serves Chinese exports to the United States, to the US economy itself, and indeed to the whole world economy. There are elements of isolationism and adventurism circulating in the foreign policy thinking around the new president. We don't know which will prevail, but that's why we're looking with interest at the impending appointment of a Secretary of State. We do know that the appointment of General Flynn as National Security Advisor to the administration is the appointment of someone with very robust instincts. His book, Field of Fight, commits America, urges America to take a, a uh, to, to undertake mobilization against the Islamic world and uh, jihadism and has some forceful things to say about China. Will the Secretary of State be as powerful as his National Security Advisor? Will the Secretary of State have different instincts from the National Security Advisor? These are questions we simply don't know. But in Australia, if I just take my country as a bit of a case study among the field of nations who describe themselves as friends, partners, or allies of the US in this region, uh, for the first time in a long time, you're having people speculate about whether our alliance with the US, which fundamentally no one challenges and which is supported by 87% of US opinion, should be expressed in a different way as we contemplate 
these currents I've described at work in a Trump president. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating said, the election of Trump forces Australians to see its alliance with the US in less of a romantic light and a more prosaic light. It is, he said, just a treaty. And he might have added a treaty that obliges both parties to consult in the event of an attack on one another, not to take action, but to consult, among other things, about taking action. One student of Southeast Asia in Australia, Professor T Tony Milner, has said the election of Trump is an opportunity for Australia to build up another pillar of its foreign policy, namely engagement with Southeast Asia. He instanced the closer links between Australia and Singapore, which have moved forward quite markedly in recent years, as an example of an approach that could lead Australia to tighter engagement with other of the ten nations in ASEAN. It's an interesting, very interesting proposition. He says, Australia needs to ensure that the opportunities and challenges of an Asian century work to our advantage. And using Australia-Singapore relations as a case in point, he argues for deeper engagement with other nations in ASEAN and indeed with South Korea. Now these are interesting ideas circulating about the direction Australia might take if a Trump presidency assumes some of the, the more challenging forms that it might assume. That's one big dynamic in our region, Trump and what he might do. The other dynamic has got relatively little attention, and that is in the wake of the arbitral decision about the Philippines claim, about, about the dispute between the Philippines and China. The Chinese diplomacy in respect of the Philippines. Yes, in the wake of that article claim, and yes, in the wake of the election of an interesting president of the Philippines. It strikes me as interesting that China obviously decided, for the time being at least, after the arbitral ruling, not to do any one of the provocative things that we considered as possibilities declare a no-fly zone, for example, as it had done in the East China Sea, or commence dredging and militarization of an artificial structure, laying out an airfield on one of these artificial islands that was built. Um, I think there have been seven islands created, three of them big ones, to demonstrate to the world its contempt for the legal process that had been at work. China hasn't done that. No if, no, no, no fly, fly zone and no resumption of dredge, dredging or militarization for the time being at least. What it has done is engage in subtle diplomacy with the Philippines, which among other things has seen Philippines fishing vessels return to Scarborough Shoal with the Chinese Coast Guard making way for them to do that. That would seem to carry two possibilities. One, that the Chinese may feel constrained by the arbitral ruling, even though, in line with their long-standing policy, they rejected it and said they wouldn't respect it, but they feel constrained by it. And secondly, that the value of the Duterte presidency is too great for them to be overlooked. It is a gift to China. But if it leads to China investing in diplomacy rather than preemptive and provocative moves, it's probably good news for the region. We've got to say immediately that the current ebb and flow in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing and different parties might determine outcomes at different times. China's probably looking, as we all are as well, at what, what a Trump administration might do and might decide. Meanwhile, those of us who count ourselves allies of the US 
have been weighing our actions. I think it's it's interesting that a conservative government in Australia, the government that replaced the government I do in, has in three respects dissented from US policy, even before Trump, in engaging with China. One was to ignore a phone call from the US president that said Australia should stay out of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Singapore, interestingly, had already joined that bank. Other nations of Asia would join in that bank. There was an argument that if China is sponsoring a multilateral bank, then it's precisely the sort of behavior we've been seeking from China, precisely the sort of commitment we've been urging China to make. Lee Kuan Yew said it in his thoughts about China, published in the book edited by Graham Allison. We wanted China to be engaged with the world, not at odds with the world and its institutions, its liberal, internationalist institutions. And Australia found, once we made the decision to ignore the American request and join the bank, as Singapore had done, and as others in the region were, with South Korea and Japan holding out, that the Europeans had been quick to join, we found that the Chinese very quickly accepted suggestions for good governance of the bank, confirming that it was a multilateral and not a Chinese bank, as it might have been. The Chinese might have said, this is our bank, and it's going to work in Southeast Asia, it's going to work throughout Asia and the world. They didn't do that. It was a multilateral institution. But America had made a mistake in resisting the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Three US admirals have suggested that Australia run patrols with them, or on their own, mimicking American freedom of navigation patrols in disputed areas of the South China Sea. Australia, I think this is extremely interesting, has not done it. Australia has not done it. From my studies, America has not made this request to any other friend, partner, or ally in the region which might be one reason why the government in Canberra has decided not to put its hand up for it. I think that's interesting and a symbol that even a, a very pro-American government in Canberra will opt to give some weighting to the Chinese view of the region and not appear to be provocative and not seek to enter the front line of this contest. The third example was American criticism an Australian decision to allow a Chinese company to buy the port in Darwin. America has Marines coming through Darwin on a rotational basis, not a base, but a rotation of American Marines for, for, for training and exercise, and did raise a concern that they've not been told. The response of the Australian Prime Minister was, well, if you want to know that this was happening, you should have taken out a subscription to the Northern Territory News. It showed a lot of same for it. Now, Australia remains very committed to the US alliance. Few countries are more comfortable with, at least up till now, at least up till November 9, with American values, nor, nor more ready to see their interests being akin with those of the US, at least up till November 9. But it is, it is interesting, like every other nation in the region, that does include Singapore, which, which feels that it's being penalized by China, like every other nation in the region, we do see that the rise of China does invite engagement, must be accommodated, but never cravenly. And through active diplomacy, we should be pressing at all times to see that China is persuaded to enter the international rules-based system. And how does, how does this aspiration come up against the challenge of a Trump administration? It's what makes our work and so, so riveting in its fascination and makes this workshop so hugely relevant. It's been a great honour to me to share these tentative thoughts with you, subject as they are to all the qualifications I need to make. The full nature of this new administration is not clear, but as it does settle into place, it's got huge implications for this region, for the rule of law in, the, in, in, uh, in South Asia, and of the regions of border. Thank you very much.